Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Clement. In the previous video, we have learned how to use 42 LEDs with just seven IO pins, thanks to the wonders of Charlie Plexing. And I'm wondering, I could also read button matrices with this, right? But small signal diodes are expensive nowadays and LEDs are cheap. So could I use normal LEDs for such a matrix? And could I even drive those LEDs also? with the same pins or just a few more? Let's find out, how hard could that be? So what is Charlie Plexing? Well, it's a method of using I.O. pins to read buttons or drive LEDs by using the properties of diodes, meaning they only conduct in one direction, not the other. And by using diodes, we can basically switch polarities in our lines and read more than one button on drive more than one LED with just two lines. Which we could also do with just two lines. Well, there's more to it. It gets bigger and it scales up and the more lines you use, the more buttons you can drive. In fact, the number of stuff you can drive with this is n squared minus n, which means for the seven lines of I.O. we used in the past project, we can drive up to 42 LEDs. So we could also read 42 buttons. According to Wikipedia, Charlie Plexing was introduced by Maxim Integrated in 2001 as a reduced pin count LED multiplexing scheme. And it's named after Charles Charlie Allen, an applications engineer who also worked on the Max 232. Maybe you know that one, that's the RS-232 transceiver chip we've used in a previous episode. But I've also heard different uh, conflicting reports on the internet. Uh, supposedly it was already in use in the 80s. If you know more about the topic and who really invented Charlie Plexing or if the origin story is completely correct, let me know in the comments. In a classic matrix, we have rows and we have columns. And we check each one of the columns to see if one of the rows has been pushed. And because we know where they connect, then we know which button has been pushed. But what happens if we push more than one button? Well, we get what's called ghost presses. It appears that buttons have been pushed that are not really have been pushed. Therefore, ghost presses. We can mitigate that by using diodes on every single one of these buttons. And that can get pretty pricey because small signal diodes are more pricey than LEDs nowadays. So I'm wondering, could we just use LEDs for that? Or could we get the diode count also down by using Charlie Plexing, getting the line count down? And then maybe we could still drive those LEDs with the same light, so have a combined matrix. Let's find out. I've set up a camera behind me with a breadboard, some LEDs, uh, some wires and some buttons. Let's find out how all these Charlie Plexing stuff works. Conveniently, the LEDs on the breadboard also show us which lines are active. So at the moment, I don't actually need a microcontroller. I can just look which LEDs are lighting up and we just connect positive and negative wires to our terminals. So we know that the current flow is currently in that direction or the other one. This is basically the same as a microcontroller would do to drive those lines, but it's more tangible and easier to understand. Every single one of you will point out that I have no current limiting resistors on these LEDs. That's because these are special five volt LEDs. The resistor is already inside, which declutters our breadboard. So for these experiments, I really like to use those available at Element 14. And they just go give away with all the hassle with the uh, resistors. So it's easier to follow where the lines go. If we just connect our two buttons through two LEDs, to our two data lines. Then if we press one of these buttons, the LED lights up because current is conducted. In that case, because both uh, LEDs are in the same direction, then both buttons would activate their respective LED. So it's an OR gate, basically. But if we switch one around, then guess what happens? Only one of them now can activate the LED and the other one would only be active if we switch polarity of our power source, then the other one would work. This is the basic principle behind Charlie Plexing. Basically, the, the button is reachable in one polarity and not in the other one. With microcontrollers, we can just switch around which pins are high and which pins are low to know which ones we want to activate. 
But there's a problem. Microcontrollers have different capabilities of syncing and sourcing current. And so usually what you do is you do not switch them around, but you use the properties in groups. So you get more than one button with one LED and then you change which lines are active. And that uh, in the end gives you the same amount of LEDs that can be driven, but it's easier to handle with a microcontroller. Welcome to the computer. Now we have our experimental setup on the breadboard connected to an Arduino Mega. And I've just used three IO lines to control six buttons and I also need three diodes. So let's see if we can control them with a bit of code. We're basically changing, exchanging complexity in circuit design for ex complexity in code. So the less pins you want to need, in this case, we only use three pins the more complex your structure on the breadboard has to be and the more complex your code is. So three pins, six buttons, and we read them in groups of two. Uh, there's like a rule with Charlie Plexing. You can, you have to structure your, uh, your rows and columns uh, very deliberately. So they make sense when you read them. And as you can see, I have three groups. But group one is not one, button one and two, it's button three and five, and group two is two and six, and group three is button one and four. This is just because of the way this is wired up. If I change these wires, then also those groups change. But every button basically has an address. For example, in group three, C3, C1, that's button one. Okay, let's flash that to the Arduino and open the serial monitor and we can see it reads the buttons. So here are my buttons and if I press them, then they change to zeros because they get pulled low. So I can prove that. Here's button one, button two, button three, four, five, and six. And if I press individual buttons, then I can make all possible combinations out of those and I won't get any ghost presses. And that's the main point behind keyboard matrices. So only the buttons that you actually want to read are read and no uh, ghost presses are present, which can happen if your button matrix is not as well designed. I've done a few experiments on this breadboard and some work up to a certain amount of LEDs or buttons. Like with four buttons, it seems everything works fine when I switch polarities. But when I want to have six buttons, basically I have to change to those groups. And in my case, I use groups of two. Yes, I use groups of two. The upper one, the upper LEDs are the LEDs that are actually working as diodes. And they don't even light up when I uh, read the buttons. And the other LEDs at the bottom, those are meant to light up when I want them to. So I can drive them similar to a matrix, but a Charlie plexed one. And for the whole thing with six buttons and six individual drivable LEDs, I just need six pins. Okay, we were able to read buttons, but now we also want to control LEDs. So here's the updated code basically. So we do uh, add some LED control lines to keep them separate from the other ones. I'm sure there is a possibility of making them the same lines with a bit more diodes maybe, but I want to keep this uh, controllable in code basically. So we have more of those and we still read all the buttons in groups, but also what we now have is functions to turn LEDs on and LEDs off. The LED on function declares those needed pins as an output and then writes them correspondingly low or high. We can declare 
which LED we want by using its address, which is basically the point where they cross on our grid. So every LED, according to our schematic, has an address, and if we use that, then this LED turns on. If we want to turn them off again, we just basically release them from reading outputs by declaring them as inputs, and we also need, already need them as inputs for reading the buttons. And because this will happen in rapid succession, we constantly engage and disengage pins. So this method, how the Arduino ID does it in their standard way of declaring pin modes and releasing them is not the ideal way to do it because it takes longer time than doing it basically in hard C language. So this is the easy version. If you want to do it like super fast, you will need to learn a bit of C, which means I will need to learn a bit of C to do that in a better way. And for my startup, I've made this startup pattern, which lights up all these LEDs in succession and turns them off again. And that is the pattern we can see when the unit boots. That's it. Wait, wait, wait. Six buttons, six lines. No, no, actually the buttons are only done with three lines. The LEDs are also done with three lines. I try to do everything with just three lines, but there are some interference problems. It's easier to drive them with three separate selector lines for the LEDs and separate selector lines for the buttons. So it's also a bit easier in code. You're always trading complexity in code for complexity in uh, circuit design. And with Charlie Plexing, you're basically getting both, but you're saving IO pins. So the point is this scales. So if I now need three lines to do all my buttons and three more lines to do six LEDs, then if I get more lines, then I get a massive amount of buttons and a massive amount of LEDs. And we can check that in KiCad and see how it scales. Welcome to my computer again and KiCad. And now we're looking at how it scales. So here is a rather complex button matrix. And as you can see, there are LEDs on there, one on each of these rows. These are the LEDs that we've used on the upper part of the breadboard, basically. So those are actually used as diodes. And these LEDs down here, these are all individually addressable LEDs. So each of these uh, LEDs has an address, like A2, for example. And if we look at another portion of the circuit, for example, when it's activated by uh, line two, then all this is switched around, like the polarity changes. And then the same line, A and B is the same line, it's just for me for <laughs> getting around. A2 would be a different line. Let's see if it's actually used. Oh, it's not even actually used, but you could basically address a different LED just by switching over the polarity. And here is basically my lines. I have 11 lines to read all the buttons and LEDs basically. And then I have three LED selector lines. These are A, B, C, D, E, F. That means when it's uh, marked as A or B, that's the same thing. C and D is the same line, E and F is the same line, but just the polarity has changed. So instead of using six lines, we can use just three lines by changing polarity reducing pin count again. And as you can see, this is a rather big matrix. So we have 50 switches on here, <laughs> quite big, but we only use 11 uh, lines for those buttons. And I have already done the calculations. I just look it up and I could address with just this 110 switches, which would also mean that with just a few more IO lines, I could also address 110 LEDs individually on the same matrix using the same pins. So this really scales. And what's the practical point of doing all that? Well, I want to build a keyboard that also lights up, not just because like fancy light up keyboard, but did you notice on a phone when you're typing and you switch with the shift key between uh, lowercase and capital letters and also to symbols? I want to have the same effect on a small keypad for a smaller device so that physically it actually lights up which uh, symbols are now active 
so I can drive that and read the buttons at the same time and also indicate which buttons are now active because maybe in some applications only certain buttons are actually useful. And I will put that all together in an upcoming project. We have explored how to use Charlie Plexing to drive a lot of buttons and a lot of LEDs with just a few I.O. pins and even using LEDs instead of expensive small signal diodes, which worked out pretty good. On the how hard could it be scale, this project is actually rather easy once you have understood the principle of Charlie Plexing. But it can get really complex when your matrix gets big and you have to think about how to connect everything, group it up and how to route the whole thing. We will explore that further in an upcoming video and I would like to know if you, now that you know that technique, if you are building a big matrix, maybe LEDs, maybe buttons, would you rather use Charlie plexing, multiplexing, or some serial IC, or just intelligent LEDs that you can feed serial data into it. What's your preferred method? Let me know on the Element 14 community. I gotta go, there's another project waiting for me, and as you know, it involves Charlie plexing. <laughs>